uh, because, uh, not because I like to dwell on evil, which this is, but because I really care about all of you. I care about America. I care about freedom. I care about happiness, fulfillment, opportunity. Uh, and that's why I talk about this, uh, because it's not enough to remember, but if we don't learn the lessons of the past. So, um, uh, without much ado, the uh, pictures you're looking at uh, on the right, I was interviewed on 60 Minutes by Anderson Cooper because he wanted to see my fake birth certificate, which you will see. It's on the PowerPoint. And uh, on the left is the cover of my book. Uh, so, uh, I'll get there with these gadgets yet. Uh, <laughs> Uh, what, uh, I, what I want to emphasize is that uh, the Holocaust uh, didn't just happen. It was the result of bad ideas, destructive ideas, harmful ideas. In the same way as the, the blessings we have in this country, uh, the freedom we enjoy, the incredibly unparalleled standard of living we enjoy, uh, is the result of good ideas. So I'm going to, with your indulgence, I'm going to trace where do these ideas come from, both the good and the bad. We have to go back to ancient Greece and Rome, more than 2,000 years. As you know, uh, the idea of self-government started in Greece. Thank you. What do I do? Okay, it's the same one. Uh, uh, and uh, Rome uh, developed a body of law that still, people still live by that. Uh, on the, uh, that's on the secular side. On the spiritual side, you have to go back more than 2,000 years to uh, Judaism, which gave us a code of ethics. Don't lie. Don't steal. Don't go around murdering people. Don't be jealous of what your neighbor has, and above all, do not do unto others what you wouldn't have others do unto you. So these are the two pillars of Western civilization, and these are the two pillars that have given us this wonderful country with the freedom and prosperity that we enjoy. I have to laugh sometimes when I think of kids today. They think they're poor if their parents can't buy them the latest cell phone. That's their idea of, oh, we don't have enough money. <laughs> they don't realize that they go from uh, climate-controlled homes to climate-controlled schools and climate-controlled cars, door-to-door -door transportation with stores bulging with food and merchandise of all kinds. They don't have a clue of what it's like not to have these things. So this, what we have, is the result of this dual tradition, which we call Western civilization. Uh, moving right along, uh, the medieval period, I don't keep, have time to give you a history lesson, but let's move on forward to the Renaissance. Both the, uh, the Greco-Roman ideals and the Judeo-Christian ideals led to the Renaissance, which is, means rebirth. An opening of minds, it gave us the great explorations when America was discovered. And uh, uh, it led to the a questioning of the Catholic Church, which gave us the Reformation. And together, these trends in the 17th and 18th century gave us the ideas of the Enlightenment, which are the foundation of our laws, of our Constitution. Now, what happened in the German lands and in Prussia uh, uh, they took the wrong fork in the road. They liked modernity, they liked science and technology, but they wanted to remain the boss. So they veered in the direction of enlightened despotism. You know what a despot is? A despot is a tyrant, a dictator. Uh, so that was, that's true for what was Germany, it was Prussia at the time, and also Russia. First wrong fork in the road. Moving right along to the Renaissance, during the, 18th, the 19th century, uh, there was a further liberalization. It was an extension of the right to vote in England, in France, uh, and uh, recognition that ordinary people have something to say. Remember, your Shakespeare plays is uh, all about aristocrats and uh, kings and princes. And in the 19th century, you talk about ordinary people. Some of you may have seen uh, the opera Carmen. Uh, the main character is, uh, is a young girl who works in a cigarette factory, so no highfalutin people. And her, uh, her lover is a one, the first lover is a soldier, a corporal, and the other one is a, uh, is a bullfighter. So you are far cry from the uh, heroes of the Shakespearean tragedies. Uh, 
So that was the good part. Again, Germany took the wrong fork in the road. Uh, it went into the direction of uh, Germany being superior, nationalism, a rabid nationalism. Deutschland über alles was the, uh, was the German uh, uh, national anthem. Uh, it also went in the direction of glorifying ethnicity. Uh, this started in the, the, the German romantics were violently uh, racist, anti-Semitic, uh, and uh, uh, this was uh, a, um, ideas that continued. And so if you go forward to the uh, Nazi ideology, you will see that these ideas were not invented by Hitler. He inherited them. He found them. They were ready made. So you had the authoritarian tradition. You had a militarist tradition that goes back to the 17th and 18th century in Prussia, the father of Frederick, Frederick I and Frederick II. Uh, you had the Romantic uh, period with its rabid nationalism. Uh, and anti-Semitism and emphasis on ethnicity. And you had a theme of the unification of all German-speaking lands. Because in 1815, when Napoleon was defeated, there was no Germany as we know it. There were 36 separate political entities. And uh, uh, some were large, like the kingdoms of Prussia and Bavaria. Some were small, like the city-states of Hamburg and Lübeck and Bremen. Uh, or the, some duchies the size of Luxembourg. And so the, uh, one of the themes throughout the 19th century was to unify all German-speaking lands into one country. And for those of you who don't recall, Germany was not unified into a single country until 1871, after the uh, Franco-Prussian War. So Germany as a unified nation is about 100 years younger than the United States. It's hard to believe. Uh, that doesn't mean there was no German identity, there was a German literature and music, but as, an, as a unified country, it didn't happen until 1871. Uh, racism was a 19th century idea. I don't think I need to belabor that. We've talked about, about that in this country. We were not immune to it. And finally, another German idea of the 19th century was to colonize lands to the east, which included Poland, the, uh, the Baltic states, and Russia. So when the Nazis invaded Poland and Russia, there were ethnic Germans who sided with Nazi Germany. So they did, you know, England and France, uh, those two countries were busy colonizing Africa and the Americas and, and Asia, but Germany wanted to conquer the lands to the east. That was a 19th century obsession. So uh, the next role model for Hitler was Mussolini. After World War I, Mussolini started the fascist party the word uh, fascism comes from the fascio, which was the symbol of the, Nazis, of the fascist party. A, uh, it was made up of little twigs, and the idea was if you, one twig is weak, but you, you bind them together and they become very strong. So that's the symbol, of, that's the fascio, and which gave the name to the fascist party. Uh, uh, notice the name of Mussolini gave himself the name of Il Duce, which means the leader. Guess what the word Führer means? The word Führer means leader. Guess what the guy in North Korea calls himself? The dear leader. Same pattern. Uh, one of the points I'm going to make is that the far right and the far left are exactly the same. The ideology may differ, but the methods are exactly the same. They both want power over the people, they want to enslave people, and they are dictators. And we'll see that in more detail. Uh, the uh, the uh, Mussolini wanted to emulate the uh, Roman Empire, and you, all of you, I'm sure, have seen some old movies where you talk about Hail Caesar. Well, you remember the, the Nazi salute patterned on, the, and the same thing with the Mussolini. And uh, we talked about the uh, uh, national symbol of the fascio. Uh, your textbooks will often tell you that uh, Hitler rose to power because of the uh, defeat in uh, World War I and because of uh, the Great Depression. Those were the triggers. They were not the root causes. You have seen the root causes. The good causes were the ideas that had been around for a long time. So the triggers were the defeat, and uh, the Treaty of Versailles wasn't so terrible, but they built it up as something awful. And so what Hitler did was to sell to the German people the idea that the Second World War wasn't a war of uh, aggression, now God forbid. We were just defending ourselves. We were defending, we were continuing, in other words, it was a continuation of World War I. 
uh, with the, the militarist tradition that existed in Germany, the idea that Germany could be defeated by Americans of all people. You know, Hitler had contempt for America. Did you know that? Yes. Because he said, America, we have such a mishmash of people from all, all over the world. He called us a mongrel people. So he had contempt for Americans. Americans can't fight. Well, we showed him, didn't we? Uh, so there was an attempt to look for scapegoats because they could not take responsibility for their defeat. And uh, the depression and inflation, and, and inflation just made things worse. So who were the scapegoats? The French, the British, the Americans, and of course the Jews. With the, the, the long history of anti-Semitism in Germany, we were very handy. You have to find a scapegoat. Here we are. If we were really so powerful, how come we were murdered by the millions? But as you will see, the truth doesn't matter. It's all propaganda. So I grew up, as you heard, in Vienna. I was born in Vienna. Here I am with my dad on the left and my older brother. And on the right is my sixth birthday. My father took me to the Prater on a paper mache horse. Okay. <laughs> It's not a real horse. But I was happy. Uh, it was a treat for me to go to the Prater. We didn't have much money, so a trip to the Prater was always exciting. Uh, so I look pretty happy. And here I am with my mom in the middle. She was a big lady, and she was very bossy, much too bossy for my good. But you know, you don't choose your parents, right? Uh, <laughs> On the left, uh, I am uh, standing in front of the Danube Canal, and on the right, I am with my older brother. He was five years older than I. He received a camera for his bar mitzvah, and so we always had pictures after that. He used to take uh, photographs of me. I was his model. You know, every time I had something nice to wear, he would say, come on, Edith, I'll take a picture. Hitler came to power in January 1933. Within weeks, he burned down the German equivalent of Congress, which is called the Reichstag. And the poster was the Reichstag on, in flame, set on fire by the communists, which wasn't true. He himself set it on fire, but it gave him an excuse to put all the communists into concentration camps. The camps were open as soon as he came to power. And on the bottom it says, trample communism and shatter social democracy. So he set out his goal. He didn't hide his intentions, but people didn't believe that he would really carry them out. On the right, there's just people watching the uh, Reichstag uh, burn down. And of course, Congress, the German Congress was never rebuilt, which means that he took upon himself, in addition to the executive, he took upon himself legislative powers. And eventually, he set up a parallel court system called the Volksgericht, or People's Court, which were like kangaroo courts, uh, parallel to the existing judicial system in Germany. So that was total control over the entire population. As soon as he came to power, again within weeks, he started a boycott against Jews. On the left, a uh, boycott against Jews, and he lists specific stores in that uh, little town that are to be boycotted. And on the right, you have the uh, German, uh, the, the brown shirts standing in front of Jewish businesses, and uh, I challenge you, def I, I, I dare you to, to go shop here. What the sign says is, defend yourself. Don't buy from Jews. What are they defending themselves against? Jews have a store. You go in, you buy what you need. But that's not the attitude. Then there were the book burnings. Here we are and it's in an institution of higher learning. And they go into schools, libraries, private homes, take out the books. Now, why would they take out books? They don't want you to know what's in the books. They only want you to know what they tell you. Whether it's North Korea or, or Venezuela, or Cuba. In Cuba, they put librarians in prison. Librarians. Because the librarians might give you a book that doesn't uh, agree with, uh, with the Castro brothers' uh, teachings. We are not talking ancient history. This is today. The lessons are for today. And that's why I am talking. It's not because I love to rehash my own personal painful journey or the pain of the Holocaust. It's because there are lessons to be learned today. There was a eugenics program. Anybody with a physical or mental disability was murdered. This is a cover of a monthly magazine that says the, uh, the new people, and it is issued by the uh, a monthly journal of the NSDAP. NSDAP were the initials of the National Socialist German Workers' Party. 
That's what the word Nazi stands for, Nationalsozialistische Deutsche Arbeiterpartei. Okay? So I told you, the far right and the far left are the same. They call themselves socialists. So the Pope objected, and the Nazis stopped. But guess what? They resumed in secrecy later on in sanatoriums, and what they did was to either starve patients or expose them in cold weather so they died of pneumonia or give them lethal injections. Take your pick. The sad thing is that the Pope, when Jews were being murdered en masse, I don't remember the voice of the Pope ever being raised to say to the Nazis, stop. So, 1930s, I was a little girl and I was aware of what was going on in Nazi Germany because my parents used to discuss politics. They read good newspapers, we lived in small quarters, my parents, we were very poor. My father was affected by the depression, he lost his business, so uh, we were extremely poor. We lived in two tiny rooms. There was no TV, of course, in those days, and I listened to the conversation, there wasn't much else to do. So I knew the, the names of the German news newspapers, the Stürmer, the Völkischer Beobachter, and uh, 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 and, and then in 1934, our chancellor was assassinated and he was uh, forced to bleed to death by two by Nazi soldiers who wouldn't allow a doctor to come and staunch his wounds. And I was six years old, I was shocked. How could you do that? My first exposure to Nazi cruelty. So in 1937, my parents decided we better get out of Vienna because there was agitation in Vienna to prepare the country for the invasion by the Nazis, by Germany. When you want to create a dictatorship, you first create unrest in the streets, and then the idea was that Hitler would bring order. Oh, he brought order, all right, some order. So, I don't know if you can, uh, let me see if I can do this. <laughs> ah, here we go. So here is uh, Austria, and there's Vienna in the northeast corner. So we went from Vienna to Venice, we stopped in Venice, which I fell in love with. I'm still in love with Venice. And then, um, and then we moved to the city of Genoa in the, uh, over here in the northern, northern part of, uh, of Italy. It's a major harbor. Uh, well, I was, uh, I was very happy in Genoa. Uh, my, I love the country. I love the climate. It was warm. Vienna is cold in the winter. The winter is terribly cold. Uh, it's a, it's a um, continental climate, so hot, very hot in the summer, very cold in the winter. And, uh, and I didn't have warm clothes, so I was always suffering from the cold. Uh, in Italy, blue skies, you know, Italians were nice. They're bubbly people, they love their bambini. <laughs> and uh, my father was making a living. Uh, what you're looking at on the left is the uh, synagogue, which at the time was brand new. Uh, it's a great temple. On the top floor was a, uh, uh, was a day school. Uh, and uh, I took that, my brother took that picture. The top right, that was a picture of Genoa. There are probably more houses now on the hills than there were when I was there as a kid. So this would be the happiest year of my childhood. It lasted exactly one year, from 1937 to 1938. When uh, Hitler marched into Vienna in March 38, we thought, oh God, are we smart? We got out in time. And if we hadn't left in, at that point when we did, I would be dead because uh, we didn't have any money, and if you didn't have any money, you were stuck in Vienna. One of my aunts didn't have any money, and she and her family were sent to Theresienstadt and from there to Auschwitz. So that was the, the itinerary. Uh, so uh, the Italians, uh, Mussolini met with Hitler in the summer of 1938 to form the Axis. And as you, as you know, the Axis was later joined by Japan. Uh, and it was these three countries that America fought against in World War II. So uh, at that point, Mussolini passed the same anti-Jewish and racist laws that existed in Germany. My father lost his job, my brother lost his job, and we had to give up our apartment, and we moved into a single room up here in this house, uh, one room for the four of us, and we tried to get out of uh, Europe. Well, America was the first country to close its doors, but then the rest of the world closed its doors too. There was a conference in Evian uh, where more than 30 countries participated and the world closed its doors to us. I think it's a reaction to that that is causing Americans now to open its doors uh, at the southern border. But that's another story, I won't get into that one. 
Uh, so here is a publication by the fascists after 19, the summer of 1938. It's called The Defense of the Race. And I don't know if you can see, on the left is a Roman profile, and next to him is a sword, and next to that is a, Jew, a caricature of a Jew, and next to that is an African. That, ladies and gentlemen, is racism. The defense of the Aryan race. This was a cartoon of that period showing uh, people get out, get out, get out. Uh, so it says go, 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 but no, where? Nobody let us in. 1938, October. Uh, France and England get together with Hitler <coughs> uh, because Hitler now wants not only to keep Austria, but he also wants the German-speaking part of Czechoslovakia. Well, I was reading up on uh, Chamberlain recently, and he did not want war, and he thought Mr. Herr Hitler could be trusted. And so he said, okay, you can keep Austria, which was annexed to Germany, got a new name. It, Austria as an independent country ceased to exist. It was called the Eastern March, the Ostmark. And uh, he also got the German-speaking part of Czechoslovakia, which are the Sudeten. Uh, and, and Hitler kept saying, this was all in the name of the unification of German-speaking countries. Remember the 19th century idea? That was his rationale, and then the Chamberlain and Daradier believed him. So they said, okay, okay, you can have uh, Vienna, and you can have the Sudeten, and then and there will be no war. And then the famous line is Chamberlain goes back to London and says, peace in our time. Six months after this was signed, uh, Hitler invaded the rest of Czechoslovakia, divided it into two countries, one in the direct German military control, and the other one was Slovakia. <coughs> one month later, Kristallnacht, the night of broken glass. It was a massive program organized by the German government where Jews were beaten up, stores were smashed and looted, uh, all the synagogues that were freestanding were burned to the ground. And still the world didn't say anything, and still the world wouldn't let us in. This was a turning point. So whatever synagogue uh, was freestanding was burned to the ground. If a synagogue was in the middle of a city block, they would have had to burn the whole city block. They didn't want to do that, so they went inside and sacked the interior. This is the main synagogue of Berlin, and uh, you're looking at it after it was sacked. The synagogue that I used to visit in Vienna, in the Seitenstettengasse, was also in the middle of a city block. So not only did they sack it, but they desecrated it by making it into a stable. <laughs> Just to, you know. This is, a, this is before the war on the top left and then the reconstructed one on the bottom left. Well, the Italians said, you gotta go, you gotta go, you gotta go. So we managed to get into France and France gave us a six month uh, uh, residence permit because we were still trying to get out of Europe and find a country that would take us in. Anything, Canada, Trinidad, you name it, Australia, anything, South Africa, you name it. The Caribbean, anything, no. Top right is a picture that I took of the city of Nice on a return visit. And on the left, the clothes you see on my back now are all from charity because we didn't have any money. We had a small subsidy from a Jewish charity and the joke was it's too, no, too much to die on but not enough to live on. So uh, my parents took in laundry from the wealthy refugees. Uh, we lived about half an hour, uh, one hour away from town. Half an hour past the last streetcar stop up the hill on the Boulevard de l'Observatoire. <clears throat> so you can see the laundry in the background. On the left, I am in public school. I'm in the back row with the light smock. Fifth from right, you can see the light smock. Well, I had just learned Italian, and in Italy they made me repeat third grade because I didn't know Italian. When I got to France, I was determined I am not repeating third grade. I was going to, uh, I was almost 11. So I spent the summer studying French pretty much on my own. I was determined. So this was, uh, and I want you to notice the size of the class. We complained so much, the Chicago teacher strike, they complained so much that classes are too large. Look at the size of that class, more than 40 kids. But boy, did we learn. It's not the size of the class, it's how it's led. This is a picture of my dad in peacetime in Vienna and on the right, my brother at the age of 16 in the city of Nice. 
When the war broke out, my father was arrested as an enemy alien, and he was sent to a French concentration camp. What you're looking at is a brick oven on the camp of Les Milles, which is a brick factory near Marseille, and that's where the French put prisoners. These were civilians. Most of the people who were sent there were, were Jewish refugees who had uh, fled Nazi Germany or Austria or Czechoslovakia. And uh, they slept on a thin layer of straw with not enough sanitation because it was a factory, it wasn't a hotel. So people got sick. And the graffiti says, this is the vermin capital of the world. I visited Les Milles. It's the only camp that is left because all the other concentration camps were made of uh, wooden barracks and so they fell apart. This one was a brick building, so you, now it's a museum near Marseille. You can visit the place. I did. I'm sorry? No, this one. Well, no, this happened when the war broke out. 1939, uh, as you know, uh, Hitler did not keep his word. September 1st, as planned, he marches into Poland. So September 3rd, uh, France and England are uh, treaty bound to declare war on Germany. And, uh, and at that point, France uh, arrests all the refugees who had fled uh, uh, from the Nazis and puts them in, in concentration camps. Now this is a topographical map of Europe, which is interesting because here is France and here's England, here is Poland, and Germany is in between. How on earth were the French and the British going to protect Poland? Totally unrealistic. But they were treaty bound, and so uh, on September 3rd, France and England declare war on Germany. Well. As you may know, Poland was defeated in five short weeks. Warsaw was leveled, uh, and the Poles were totally unprepared for modern warfare. They met uh, German tanks on horseback. They were not as developed technologically. So uh, during the winter months, nothing much happened. Uh, because you don't care, you don't do military campaigns in the dead of winter. So the French uh, had what they call la drôle de guerre, or the phony war. The Germans called it the Sitzkrieg, or the sitting war. And there were occasional uh, skirmishes on the, uh, on the border here. This is the Franco-German border, OK? I don't know if you can see that. Which was fortified, and the French thought, oh, France is impregnable. We've got our ligne Maginot, our Maginot fortifications, and they can't get in. Well, the Germans knew about the ligne Maginot, of course. So come spring, May 1940, they bypassed the Ligne Maginot, and they went to the lower countries. They went to Holland and Belgium and straight to Paris. France fell in five short weeks, to everybody's amazement. It was total chaos. I was still in Nice at the time. My father was in a concentration camp. And uh, total chaos. The streets, uh, the roads were flooded with refugees. The French government fled Paris. They went to the city of Bordeaux, and they signed an armistice. And in the armistice, there is a clause where the French Third Republic, the land of liberté, égalité, fraternité, agreed to hand over to Germany all those who had fled Nazi Germany. And this, of course, sealed our fate. Uh, France was divided into two. Um, the, uh, the northern half, including Paris and the Atlantic coast, under direct German military control. The southern half, so-called Free France, uh, uh, with the capital in the uh, resort town of Vichy. So it's often referred to as Vichy France. <clears throat> now, what you're looking at is a map that, of 1942. In 1940, uh, Germany uh, controlled northern France, all of Germany, the Low Countries, Denmark, Norway, uh, and, uh, uh, and, go, and, and Poland, and the Baltics, okay? They hadn't occupied, they hadn't invaded Russia yet. The, the, the countries in orange down below were allied of, uh, allies of Germany. Uh, Italy, Hungary, Croatia, Yugoslavia, all this was, uh, was and Greece had been conquered. All this was part of uh, now supporting the German war effort. In 1940, England stood alone. There is England. England stood alone. And if it hadn't been for Churchill, who said in his speech, we will never surrender, 
Europe would have been enslaved to the Nazi dictatorship for decades. America was isolationist. America didn't want to be involved. Initially, America didn't even want to supply uh, and support the British war effort. They made the, uh, Roosevelt went to some old cockamamie detours, sending ships to Canada, and then from Canada they went to help England. Because Americans were not prepared, they didn't want it. And for a year and a half, until Pearl Harbor, England fought alone. And if it hadn't been, and I see some different people from different parts of the world, if it hadn't been for the help of what was then the British Empire, the colonies of India, and Australia, and Canada, England couldn't have done it, but even so, they needed American help. Well, when the uh, Germans occupied France, they did the same thing in France they had done in Germany. They took away businesses from Jews and gave it to their cronies. This is a small business. They were repairing fountain pens in those days. On Stilo is a fountain pen in French. <coughs> they took it from a Jewish owner and gave it to a crony. Big business, small business, property, assets, whatever, was taken away and given to their cronies. That's how you buy loyalty. That's what they do in communist China. That's what they do in the Soviet Union. That's what they do in uh, Venezuela. That's what they do anywhere where you have dictators. I'm a foe of dictatorships, in case you haven't noticed. I am very passionate about freedom. The freedom Americans take for granted. Don't. It's very fragile. It was Reagan who said, uh, freedom is only, uh, the loss, you, loss of freedom is only one generation away. You have to protect it and preserve it, and work to preserve it. So my mother and I, my brother was arrested when France fell. My brother was arrested and sent to labor camps in France. And uh, my mother and I, we were kicked out of Nice, which was forbidden to Jews. So here I am on the left. I still look like a schoolgirl. I'm 13 years old, no more school. The schooling you take for granted that is served on, your, on a platter for you, I didn't get it. So on the right, it's a few months later, I'm working as a farmhand. I'm outgrowing my clothes. I have nothing to wear. I'm not getting enough to eat. I'm never skinny, by the way. I had my DNA done. And uh, <laughs> oh, you're going to laugh for this one. I have, I'm about 1% Neanderthal. <laughs> <laughs> Most of us are 1% Neanderthal. And uh, also, I have a tendency to weigh more than average. Like, I didn't know that. And for this, I had to pay $100 to find out that I tend, have a tendency to weigh more than average, so it goes. So I, was never, I never looked skinny. Anyway, I'm working as a farmhand, and uh, by 1942, uh, things got very bad. This is my brother on the left, working in a quarry, in a labor camp, and on the right is his last photograph. He was 19 years old. I have to read to you the speech by Hitler just so you know what you're up against. This is a speech he gave a couple of days before the invasion of Poland in uh, September 1939. He gave that talk to his cronies, to his generals and some cronies. Here's what he says. On the eve of the invasion of Poland, our strength consists in our speed and in our brutality. Genghis Khan, that was his role model. Genghis Khan led millions of women and children to slaughter with premeditation and a happy heart. It's a matter of indifference to me what a weak Western European civilization will say about me. I have issued the command that our war aim does not consist in reaching certain lines, but in the physical destruction of the enemy. Accordingly, I have placed my death head formations, that's the SS, in uh, readiness with orders for them to send to death, mercilessly and without compassion, men, women, and children of Polish derivation. Did you know that? You only know about the genocide of Jews. Did you know that it applied to other people? Anybody who wasn't German. The Poles were to be used as slave labor only and worked to death. Only this shall we gain the living space, the Lebensraum, which we need who, after all, speaks today of the genocide of the Armenians. He was right. The Armenians were murdered in 1916, between 1916 and 1923, by Turkey. 
They were a Christian minority in Muslim majority Turkey, and they were butchered. So there are many Armenians who are in the West, in France, in America, all the names ending in I-N, you know, like Kachatorian, uh, who was a great composer. That was his role model, Genghis Khan and the Armenian Genocide. And in January 1942, a couple of German uh, big brass got together at the, uh, at the house outside of Berlin called Banze, the villa in Banze, to say, to implement the mass murder of all the Jews of Europe. This was in the Wall Street Journal two days, a couple of days ago, would you believe? Uh, U.S. recognizes the Armenian Genocide. October 1930, 2019. Turkey has yet to recognize that genocide. They have yet to recognize that responsibility. They don't like that. That America should recognize it. Took them over 100 years. This is a group of uh, Jews who come from ghettos. You notice the men are gone. The train is behind them. And you know where they're headed. The difference between war and genocide is in war you have two armed groups that fight each other. In genocide you have one armed group that attacks a civilian population that is not armed, typically women and children. Nice. That's what you're up against. Arrival in Auschwitz. These are people from Western Europe. They're still standing. The men on one side, the women on the other, the Germans standing there, and the uh, German doctor, Dr. Mengele, who decides who shall live and who shall die. If you were too old or too young or too weak, you were murdered right away. The others were sent to work and they were worked to death because the German Nazis had no intention of keeping them alive. And the working conditions were abominable. I won't spend time on that. My father and my brother were sent to, from the camps where they were in the south of France to a camp outside of Paris called Drancy. If you go to Paris, you fly into Paris, you go from the airport to the city, uh, you will pass by the suburb of Drancy. It's a blue collar suburb. Very, people still live there. And they were put, uh, they were processed because the Germans are very thorough, so they were processed, you know, name, birth date, birthplace, nationality. And then uh, they were packed, that took about a week, and then they were put into sealed cattle cars for a journey of three days and three nights to Auschwitz without food, without water, without sanitation. Arrival in Auschwitz, it took the Germans two hours to, quote, process a thousand people who were sent directly to their death and who were sent to work. Two hours. This is, I don't know if you can see that, but there are, uh, the, this is a picture showing all the concentration camps in France. People don't know there were concentration camps in France. They were not death camps, but they were concentration camps <coughs> with abominable living conditions. And because the Germans kept records, I copied a, the pages on which my father's name appears and my brother's name. They were carbon copies of the records kept by the Germans, they were typed and they were put together by Serge Klasfeld, whose father was also murdered in Auschwitz. So it's Le Memorial de la Deportation des Juifs de France. Almost 80,000 names, and that's just France. For those who say it didn't happen, <coughs> don't I wish it didn't happen? But there are still people who say it didn't happen. No, no. So things got hot, and I was helped to go into hiding by the Jewish uh, resistance. So they helped me get uh, false papers. On the left is that fake birth certificate that Anderson Cooper wanted to see. I changed my name from Edith Meyer. I became Elise Maillet, which sounds more French. Uh, and uh, I was the daughter of the non-practicing Roman Catholics because at that time, uh, about 97% uh, of the French were Roman Catholic. Now it's uh, less because you have about 10% Muslims in France. Uh, latest statistics as far as I know. And on the top right, I'm in a uh, Catholic school for girls run by the good nuns. And I'm in the front row uh, on the far left. You can't see me, but that's me, seated. The kids were nice. Uh, they were not spying on me, but I was on my guard at all times. I had to get used to a new name. I was afraid that if they were roll call, 
that when they call my new name, I wouldn't respond like you're supposed to respond when somebody calls your name, you have a reflex. I was tense all the time. I was uh, watching myself all the time. It doesn't, it sounds glamorous, but it's not uh, to be in hiding like that in plain sight because you're afraid to give, to give yourself away. You can't say anything, you can't share anything, you can't write anything down. Uh, so it's a, it's a, uh, it, it builds a lot of pressure. And at some point in the course of a year, I thought I was gonna explode because of the pressure just builds and builds and builds. Well, as I said, the kids were nice, but in the summer, they took the picture home, showed it to their friends and relatives, and somebody from my village recognized me. Next thing I knew, Mother Superior calls me in, you were found out, you gotta go. This was the first stop. Uh, I, uh, I was gone the next day. Uh, I have to tell you, I added it up once. I moved 13 times in the space of a year. There was always something that happened. After this, I ended up uh, in the hospital with uh, diphtheria, which is a terrible illness. I'm glad you're vaccinated. It's an awful illness. You know, your throat membranes swell and you suffocate. In the old days, the only thing they could do was to cut open a, uh, make an opening here to let people breathe through, directly through the trachea. I was very sick. Well, I got better after a month when I came down with scarlet fever. And at that point, I was ready to give up because the war for me had been going on for five long years. The persecution had been going on for five long years. I couldn't take it anymore. And I said, we're all going to die sooner or later and I didn't want to die alone. I wanted to go back with my mommy to the village and, uh, and die with her. Well, I didn't die, here I am. There were some very, very devoted members of the Jewish resistance, all mostly young people, who were very helpful. So that's why I'm here, to tell the story. Uh, this was another hiding place, and this is during a break. Uh, and. Uh, uh, eventually, they were picking up everybody. I mean, the goal was to kill us all, which they have done quite successfully. I visited Yugoslavia, former Yugoslavia, two years ago, and there were large Jewish communities completely wiped out. All that's left is a museum. That's in Europe. So we went to, uh, I was picked up one day, uh, taken to a hotel, and I, you learn not to ask questions, because the less you know, the better off you are. So I thought, well, I'm just going to another hiding place, whatever the reason, I, that you don't question, just go. And uh, here we were, a bunch of teenagers, and this lady said, tomorrow we're going to try and smuggle you into Switzerland. The, the key was to get out of France. The Swiss accepted kids up to the age of, 18, uh, up to the age of 16. But the key was to get out of France, because France, they didn't want us to go, they wanted to kill us, remember? It's quite a story, and it's the first story I wrote down because it was so dramatic. So um, I, we made it. The young woman on the top left was our guide. And when we got to the Swiss border, she stayed on the French side. And I said to her, aren't you coming with us? She said, no. A week later, she went back, took another 20 kids to the border. They were caught. They were arrested. And uh, the Nazis interrogated the boys and the girls separately. So the boys were beaten up. And then they interrogated the girls. You know what they did for the girls? They had them stripped naked to shame them, to leer at them. This is called sadism in my book. Young girls. But she was tortured and murdered. So this is my memorial to her. She was 21 years old. In Switzerland, I still didn't go to school. I went to work. I worked as a nanny for the people who ran this home for Jewish kids, Jewish refugee kids. That was their little girl. And I was concerned about, I had no skills. I had no skills. I'm now 16 years old. I have no skills. I, was, I, have, no, I have an elementary school education and I have no skills. So I said to my boss, who was the mother of this child, I need to learn how to type. She couldn't care less about me. Unlike your professors who want you to learn and who want you to know something and who want you to do well, and you, want you to, and you want to help you build a good life and the skills you need to build a good life. She couldn't care less about me. So after three months, she finally said, you want to learn how to type? Here's a typewriter, here's a book. Go type. Just like that. And then I said to her, I have to learn English. Took another three months. For six months, I pleaded with her, I need to learn English. 
So she finally assigned there one of the counselors. The counselors were all refugees, so they were well educated. And he gave me a textbook. And I met with him three times a week for 20 minutes. And I spent two hours every night after putting in a 10 or 12 hour day taking care of this little baby. I studied for two hours every night, six nights a week. I studied English. In three months, I finished the textbook. I knew my regular verbs. I knew my basic grammar. I also know not to say I should have went. I also know when it's ITS with an apostrophe or without it. And this was, would come in very handy later on. Three months. One contact hour, 12 study hours. That's how you learn. I was determined. When the war was over, this is what Germany looked like. So it happens to big bullies sometimes. We uh, were, we had nothing. My mother had survived, and I had absolutely nothing. I had no country, I had no money, I had no education, and I had no skills, and I had no help. And I had a triple task, which was, I had to go to work, we had to eat, my mother had no skills either. She was uh, born, you know, in 1903 and raised to be a housewife. She learned how to play the piano, a little French. She embroidered beautifully. She knew how to cook. She had no skills, so she worked in sweatshops. And she was always fired. She was always losing her job. And, uh, and, I, had, and I wanted an education. And I had to come, the other thing I had to do was to come to terms with man's inhumanity to man. How do you do that? I was 17 years old. How do you confront that abomination? The country that gave us Goethe and Schiller and the Ode to Joy and Beethoven, you know? All men become brothers. The same country with a high literacy level. They were smart people. They were Christian. The churches remained open in World War II. How do you confront such abominations? It took a lot of work, let me tell you. So I told everybody, we lived in this, on the bottom left is the slum we lived in. There were two minuscule apartments, two, two tiny rooms per apartment, no running water. I had to go to the end of the block to get my water, to do my laundry by hand, to rinse it. Uh, someone went out to the cold water. So I used to schlep my, uh, my bucket and my pitcher several times a day for cooking, for washing. And then there was a hole in the ground in the backyard shared by the other tenants. You know, you do your thing. And my neighbors used to miss. It was disgusting. And I remember vouching to myself, I will not live like that. I will not live like that. Well, I told everybody I wanted an education. I wanted an education more than anything else. So finally, I was referred to a social worker who said, I have a little bit of money, and I can give you money for a one-year scholarship on one condition. You, you, you pass the baccalaureate, the French baccalaureate, at the end of the year, which meant catching up six years in one. Crazy. I'd never had algebra. I had a great school education. I knew how to read and write and count, period. Well, it was take it or leave it. It's all the money she had. So I took it. And I didn't do anything but study, 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 study. 12 hours a day, 8 to 12, 2 to 6, and uh, 8 to midnight, or to 1 or 2 a.m. And I got up every morning at 6, did my exercises for my posture, so I stand up straight. Well, I passed the first baccalaureate. Eventually, I got my second baccalaureate, and then I went to the University of Toulouse, where I got a graduate degree before coming to the United States. After the second baccalaureate, we were totally impoverished. We had nothing. My mother had lost her job again. And so I took this job as a sales girl on the outdoor markets. And you know, in America, we talk a lot about uh, race issues and discrimination based on race. But in Europe, there's a lot of discrimination based on social class. It is less so today, but it's still there. And it was there when I was living in France. So nice girls aren't supposed to do that kind of work. It was an honest job, but no, you're not supposed to. So it was looked down upon. We don't know about the class business in America, thank God for that. Uh, in America, every, every job is a, is a good job. It's respected, whether you start at McDonald's or, or anything else, it doesn't matter. It's an honest job, but this was looked down upon. 
So uh, since I had no money, I ended up making uh, clothes for myself. I made that dress, which I wore the, when I met my husband in New York. And this is what I looked like when I came to America. Uh, a cartoon I made during a, uh, an art therapy workshop with a friend of mine. On the left, you have chains that are broken, terrible weather, storms, darkness. And then very, very slowly, I climb out of the hole very slowly until I make it. it. Sort of symbolizes my journey. So here I am, a college professor on the right. That's what I look like as a college professor. I'm 34 years old. And uh, for those of you who don't have, who have a short memory, because Jews knew what it was like to be persecuted and discriminated against, Jews were in the forefront of the civil rights movement. So here we are with Martin Luther King, a rabbi on the right, and the Torah. People forgot that too. And for those who say it didn't happen, these are the records kept by the Germans. They're thorough, they're gründlich. These records have now been digitized. They're available on the internet. But it didn't happen. No, no, it's a lie. Right. So the question I had to deal with, and we all have to deal with that, is how did the Germans do that? They're nice people. You go to Germany, they're nice people. And I have to read to you what Goebbels said. If you tell a lie big enough and keep repeating it, people will eventually come to believe it. If you say today that Israel is an apartheid state, and you keep repeating it, some people believe it. The lie can be maintained only if the state can shield the people from the consequences of the lie. It thus becomes vitally important for the state to use all of its power to repress dissent. China? Iran? For the truth is the moral enemy of the lie. I'm sorry, the mortal enemy of the lie. And thus, by extension, the truth is the greatest enemy of the state. In a totalitarian society, the books are burned. There is censorship. China is controlling the internet now. They don't want people to know the truth. These are not, I am not talking ancient history. I am talking now. And I'm happy when we have some sports figures and some Americans who speak up to support the people of Hong Kong. I'm happy about that. Because if we don't, who will? So, every German had to have a radio. There was no TV in those days. Radios were fairly new. Why did they need a radio? Because they had to hear the speeches, the Hitler speeches. He had trained himself to give mesmerizing speeches. And to show you the extent to which the Germans were kept in ignorance, this is a poster from 1943. This is after America entered World War II. And it says, motto 1943 without stopping forward to final victory. And the villains, we are in good company. The Russians, the Americans, the British, and of course, the Jews. What else? Aren't we powerful? That's why we died, six million. They're so powerful. If you listen to a foreign radio station, you were branded as traitor and you were sent to a concentration camp. Indoctrination of the young, the textbooks, nonstop. This is, these are quotes by Lenin and Hitler, both. All 10-year-old boys into the Hitler Youth. Notice the, the personality cult in the background. And, uh, and it says, youth serves the Fuhrer. Imagine somebody telling you you serve the state. And the girls are not exempt. You too belong to the Fuhrer. Imagine somebody telling you you belong to the state. Unthinkable in a free society. That's what happens in a dictatorship. You don't belong to yourself, you belong to the state. In a free society, the people we send to Washington are supposed to provide services for us. In a dictatorship, we are supposed to support the state. And of course, if you think only Jews were persecuted, uh, this is a beautiful story. Pastor Tok Tokme, uh, his nephew was murdered because they dared to speak up. Uh, Father Maximilian Kolbe was a, was a Catholic priest who was murdered in Auschwitz. He opposed the Nazis. And the uh, also famous uh, Protestant theologian, Pastor Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who, wrote, who was imprisoned. He wrote a lot of letters from prison that have been published. And uh, just before he could be liberated, days before his liberation, the Nazis killed him. So uh, the methods, massive propaganda and lies, 
censorship and mind control, indoctrination of the young, manipulation through favors, threats, violence, and if that doesn't work, murder, massive murder. Uh, you will get those, these are the 10 lessons from my life, I won't go over all of them, but I just want to review a couple. It all starts with the ideas that you put into your heads. What you think matters, because what you think determines what you say, and it determines what you do. So watch what ideas we put into our heads. It is our ideas and our thoughts that shape our lives and our society as a whole. Uh, lesson number two is about hatred. Let go of it. I don't hate anybody. I don't even hate the terrorists who killed us on 9-11. I certainly don't hate the Nazis. Let it go. As the Christians say, let go and let God. I don't want hatred in my life. You hate me, I don't have to hate you back. I can stop the hatred with me. Because otherwise it's like playing ping pong. You hate me, I hate you back, we play ping pong back and forth, you know? Let it go. Give it to the universe, give it to God, let it go. And, and letting go of hatred is a very liberating experience. Because then you are free to get on with your own life. You don't have to focus on, oh, I hate that person, what is she doing now? No. Just, just get on. I have a lot of compassion for the Palestinian children. They are beautiful children, and they are taught that their goal in life is to become a shaheed and a martyr. Poor kids, why don't you let them be and let them develop and, and grow and enjoy life? Life is beautiful. Oh, sorry. Uh, the other one, uh, I want to talk about our shared values. It is important to have shared values uh, respecting life, respecting one another, don't lie, don't steal, don't go around murdering people, don't want to others what you wouldn't have others do unto you. Basic, very basic values. We can disagree on what is the best way to solve a specific problem, but we have to have this basic underlying shared uh, understanding. Something else that is important is that uh, knowledge is not enough. Because uh, the Germans were very knowledgeable. They were brilliant people. I mean, the people who built the gas chambers were chemists. They had PhDs in chemistry. The ones who built Auschwitz, they were uh, engineers. They were very smart people. So knowledge can be used for good and it can be used for evil. Nuclear energy can be used to heat our homes or it can be used to threaten our neighbors like North Korea is doing and like Iran is doing. So you have to have a moral compass in order to use your knowledge for good. And finally, I'd like to end with uh, Pierre Curie, a quote from Pierre Curie, the great French physicist. Il faut faire de sa vie un rêve et de ce rêve une réalité. We must make of our life a dream and turn that dream into reality. But first comes your vision of what you want, the kind of life you want, the kind of society you want. And then you create it in your own mind and then you go about to bring it. You do what it takes to bring it about. Thank you very much for your attention. Ask me anything you want. You already know how old I am, so that's settled. My name is Rotem. Uh, I work as the bodyguard of the Israeli ambassador to the U.S. Um, I just came back from California, San Francisco, and in one of the events we had a big protest uh, from the BDS. They held signs com compared Israel to Nazi, Nazi Germany. What do you think about this comparison? I didn't understand. I'm sorry, I didn't understand. In, what, in one of the BDS protests that what? I saw, they held a sign with a uh, compared Israel flag to the Nazi Germany flag. What do you think about this comparison? To compare Israel to Nazi Germany is an outrage. I've been to Israel. I've seen people of different backgrounds. It's a, actually, it's a society very much like ours. People of every color, of every shade, and of different religions. They're Christians, they're Jews, they're Arabs, they're Muslims, they're Christian Arabs, they're Muslim Arabs. They're Muslims who sit in the Israeli parliament, in the Israeli equivalent of Congress. And there's, a, there's an Arab party that is uh, active. They, they won a lot more votes on this last election. 
So uh, people who say that repeat propaganda and just show their ignorance of what it's really like. It's, it doesn't, it's not the truth. And unless you've been there, you believe it. Because if there's enough, remember Goebbels, if you repeat a lie often enough, people will re believe it. It doesn't mean it make it, uh, that, that it's true. Thank you. That's the sad story, propaganda. Hello, <laughs> my name's Chrissy and I work here in facilities. I just wanna say how thankful I am that you came here today and your story is incredible. And the whole idea of your thoughts that, and how that affects you and oh my gosh, it's making me a little choked up. <laughs> it's just so powerful. Um, but my question was, um, how many languages do you speak? And in your head, what are you speaking? Just curious. Well, uh, I'm fluent in three, French, German, and English. And uh, my Italian is a little rusty. But when I go to Italy, they ask me if I'm Italian. Oh. Because, because I have a good pronunciation. But uh, the other day, I, was, I ran into a young uh, German student who is here on an exchange program. And we switched to German, and I was rattling off German, and all somewhere, it's always someplace up in the back of the head. Yeah. So, yeah, and I speak French a lot, because uh, my son-in-law is French, so I, I speak French frequently. So, yeah, no, they are, they, I have native fluency in those, in those two, French and German. In English, some people tell me there's a bit of an accent. I don't hear it anymore, so I can't correct it. <laughs> but, and it, the, my Italian pronunciation is good, so whenever I go to Italy, I take out my Italian books at home, and I read out loud and I review my Italian grammar because the irregular verbs are always giving me a headache. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, but that's, yeah. Thank you. Just, it just, you know, you have to want to communicate, I think. Yeah. Hello, my name is Kim. I just wondered, you were separated from your father and your brother at an early age and then later on separated from your mother. How did you, find out what was going on with them, or was that after everything ended that you did research and found out what had happened to your family? How did I find out? How did you find out what was happening with your family? Like, when did you find out about okay. your brother and uh, father? That's a good question, uh, because during the war, we, there, was, there was censorship. Uh, while my father and my brother were in French concentration camps, they were able to write to us, okay? Once they crossed the demarcation line, and that's in my book, they were given a postcard, uh, basically to say the demarcation line was the line that separated the, uh, Vichy France, the southern part, from the uh, area occupied under direct German military occupation. Okay, that was the demarcation line. And uh, so they said, goodbye, we're going into the territory controlled by Germany. Uh, goodbye, God bless you, I hope to see you again, uh, period. Uh, that's all we knew. I didn't even know about Drancy at th that point. When I got to Switzerland, I informed the Red Cross, I gave them the information I knew, and they wrote back to me. It took them, uh, it took them a while, but eventually they wrote back and they said that they were sent from the demarcation line to the camp of Drancy, and then from there to Auschwitz. So I knew they had been sent to Auschwitz. In Switzerland, uh, until the war was over, I had no idea that Auschwitz was a mass murder camp. Uh, I thought it was a slave labor camp because that was the pretense that people were going to Germany to work and to, uh, to, uh, to be sent to Poland to resettle. Remember the idea of resettling Poland? That was the lie. And uh, so I didn't really know until the Allies marched into the camps and then we found out what happened. Uh, and so you, you found out piecemeal. You know, and, then, and then we still had hopes that my brother might have survived because he was young and uh, vigor, more vigorous, my father, after three years in French concentration camps. And that's in my book, too. It was a mess. It was a mess. He was uh, 52 at that point, and, and he didn't stand much of a chance. But we thought my brother did and didn't. So the, the, the whole the realization that they are dead dawns on you gradually. It's, it's very painful. Yes. It's very painful. Thank you it, so much. It's, it's haunting. Uh, you know, I, I think I've come to terms with this and I've lived a full life. Uh, you know, I'm married, I have children, I have grandchildren, uh, but uh, the pain never completely goes away. It's, it's always there. It's, uh, uh, and, and you know, when I look around, uh, the, the, you open up the, the news, whether it's the TV or the newspaper, the man's inhumanity to man, the mass murder, the shootings, it's, it's just unconscionable. I'm going to be a part of a, of a, a dialogue on genocide and I gave some thought to that, and before I knew it, I had about a dozen genocides. I mean, the Soviet Union killed 20 million people, just like that. 
uh, communist China, 80 million people murdered. Why? Because they don't want to follow the communist line. I don't know the numbers for Cuba or for Venezuela. It's, it's insane. It's insane. And in, 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 in Iran, the Baha'i are persecuted. Why? What have you done? I mean, it's a gentle religion. It doesn't matter. It's, it's insane. The man's uh, propensity to, to kill instead of to build is, is hard to understand. I haven't figured it out yet. And I, and, I, and I know that there are some people who say, you know, if God can allow Auschwitz, then there is no God. That's nonsense, because it wasn't God who built Auschwitz. It was human beings. It was men. Mm -hmm. And we were given free will. Mm -hmm. So, food for thought. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Uh, thank you. I think you had told us that Deutschland über alles was the uh, German national anthem in the 1930s. Would you please translate that for us so that people can better understand the frame of mind of those who are going through that system and obeying that system? It was Deutschland, Deutschland über alles, über alles in der Welt, which means Germany, Germany above everything, above everything in the world. And Hitler also told uh, Mussolini that because he had this uh, sense of shortage, there's not enough of anything, there's not enough food, there's not enough manpower, and the Germans are going to be the last ones on earth because they will be get, gather all the resources for themselves. So this was uh, a Malthusian kind of uh, vision of, of life. You see. You. And, and when the Nazis occupied, and this is something you may not know, when the Nazis occupied uh, uh, all these countries like Holland, Belgium, France, uh, they uh, took out foodstuffs, which is why we were starving. They took out works of art, you know that, that's still a problem, uh, uh, which is ongoing. They took out manpower. Every young man age 18 to 20 had to go to work in Germany because the Germans were fighting a war on two fronts. And so somebody had to till the fields and somebody had to work in their munitions factories. So they had slave labor working in their munitions factories and then they had the uh, young men for two years, they went to Germany to work and also in the munitions factories. I mean, next to Auschwitz was the, was the uh, munitions factory uh, with uh, Krupp. Krupp had its factory up there. I can't buy any Krupp uh, merchandise because it would remind me all the time of what they did during the war using slave labor. So they thought that they would be the last ones to be alive because they take all, this, all the resources from everybody else for themselves. And the truth is that the Germans did not suffer during the war until the, the mass bombings because they lived very well. They had all the resources from the occupied territories. Uh, so this was, uh, uh, this was the, the implementation of Germany above everything in the world. Hi, so um, my question for this is, during this part, like current point in time, has anybody reached out to you or reunited with you for something that you went through, like went through something similar to you? Yeah, sorry. So has anybody like reached out to you and or tried to get together with you because they got, they sent something or had something similar happen to you? or had like a similar type of thing go on or went through what you went through and tried to talk with you about it? And if so, how did the conversation go? Maybe other survivors, I guess he's asking, have other I people with common experience reached you? Have other people reached out to me? What kind of other people? Other people that are either Jewish or the people that were you mean nannies in, similar during to the war you. or after the war? Yes, after the war. After the war. Well, you know, we were all in the same boat. Uh, like the man I was working for, for instance, in that picture I showed you, before the war, he had a degree in ag agricultural engineering, and he was also trying to rebuild his life. Uh, uh, this was not his profession. He had a wife and a son, and he was trying to make a living. So this was the cheapest way to rebuild your life. Uh, uh, you see, to get, all you needed was a van and some merchandise. In a, in a tent, and you pitched a tent in a different town every day, you went to a different market town every day. And so the, he, he was also in the same boat, uh, just a little older than I was. But uh, uh, you have to understand that uh, Europe was devastated. The French had suffered four long years of Nazi occupation. Everything was taken out, as I mentioned, foodstuff, manpower, and, and you know, if the girls were walking around with Germans, uh, you know what they did to the women who walked around with Germans? They shaved their heads and watched them in the street to shame them. That's what they did. So France was full of hatred. 
There was a lot of hatred. There was a lot of settling of accounts. There was uh, some lawlessness in the immediate afterwards because if somebody worked with the Nazis and made money, uh, they were profiteers, they were considered collaborators, and sometimes they were shot. I mean, there was no, uh, there was, you know, it's, you, it, the American GIs who came back were greeted as heroes, and rightly so. Uh, they came back to a country that was intact. So they could get married with their sweethearts and, and have, uh, buy a house uh, in the Levitons of this world and, and, and build their family and get back to work. Europe was devastated. Half the people of Europe were not where they were supposed to be. You had armies, you had refugees, you had, uh, you had uh, people who fled the cities to get something to eat. I mean, it was chaos. It, was, it took a while. There were no, everything was, France regressed. Uh, I mean, I, I talk about it in my book, there was agricultural machinery, but because there was no gasoline, the Germans took the gasoline. So everything was done by hand, as if you, like in the Middle Ages. You know, so there was no, there, and there was no Jewish community. The, way the Jewish community was destroyed. Most of us were killed. So the money, the help I had, the, the little money that came, came from the United States, from Jewish charities. It takes a while to rebuild. And we didn't have enough to eat until the Marshall Plan. It was 1947. We had rationing. It wasn't as severe as during the occupation, but it was still rationing until 1947-48, when the Marshall Plan went into effect. And I remember that. I was a student at the time. And we, uh, with a bunch of teenagers, we went to the railroad station. There was a train with the American flag and the French flag, and the train de l'amitié, the friendship train. And we were all excited, and, and for, right, for good reason. It takes a while, you know. This was a devastating war. This was total war. So there was no, no, no structure, if you will. The infrastructure was also destroyed. Usha, I think this needs to be the last question because it's the top of the hour. Thank you. Well, okay. uh, there are not that many questions, it's just one more. Yes. Hi, thank you so much for coming and sharing your story. Um, when you talk about the importance of forgiveness and not having hatred, what helped you move past the trauma and the hatred? What helped me what? What helped you move past the trauma from living this. What helped me heal the trauma? It's a long story. I talk about it in my book. It's a, it's a spiritual, I would say, in a, in a, briefly, spirituality. Because logic doesn't work. Only spirituality. If, if you can understand, and that's my view, if you can understand that each one of us is a, is a spiritual being, a divine being, we have the same essence. We have the same divine essence, regardless of our religious affiliation, regardless of our skin color, regardless of our age or where we come from. We are all manifestations of life in its many forms. And if you can understand that, that this is what human beings are, every one of us, then you can't hate them because they're like, they're like me. They're just another manifestation of the same life force some people call it God. Call it what you want. And, and that's the only way. And then you can't, you can't hate anybody. You see? So it's a, it's a uh, in other words, you have to transcend ordinary thinking. Because ordinary thinking isn't enough. Doesn't explain anything. Doesn't help. It's only at a certain level of spirituality. And that's, that's where I eventually ended up. It took me a while because I did it on my own. I did a lot of reading, and lot, you know. But it didn't just happen like that, and I had to mature a little bit and learn and so on. But that's how I ended up, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for the question.